We take you to San Antonio, where Julian Castro is taking the stage. He's expected to announce his bid for the 2020 presidential run. First of all, I, uh, I want to say a big thank you to, uh, to my mom. I bet there are a lot of y'all that may have come here to see her instead of me. You know, uh, my mom grew up on this west side of San Antonio, and uh, she got involved in politics a long time ago because uh, she wanted to improve her community here on the west side to make sure that folks had basic things like streets and drainage. And so she got active back then in the Young Democrats. And then she ran, when she was 23 years old, with this slate called the Committee for Body of Betterment. And their slogan was, give government back to the people. Back then, as y'all remember, they didn't have single member districts, so very few women and people of color ever got elected. All of that slate of the Committee for Body of Betterment lost in April of 1971. But on election night, one of the local reporters asked her how she felt. She felt that she felt good about what they had done and that they'd be back. Well, Mom, I think we're back. You know, so many journeys uh, for me and for my family have started right here. And uh, today, we begin another one. In this journey, I am so lucky to have an incredible partner in my wife, Erica. Yeah. And a wonderful inspiration in our daughter, whom many of y'all know, Karina. Yeah. And in our little one, Christian. So I want to thank each and every one of you as well for being here today and joining us. What a great crowd we got out here. I also want to take a moment to say thank you to the press who are here. You know, there was a time, there was a time when Joaquin and I thought we were going to go into journalism. And so I know that the press work hard and that they are the friend of the truth in this country. Thank you very much for being here. So this is a special place for all of us, this west side of San Antonio. This is the place where my grandmother Victoria came in 1922 when she immigrated from Mexico as a seven-year-old orphan. It's where she grew up where she worked hard for years as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter while raising my mom as a single parent. It's where my mother became an activist, working to improve the quality of life for her own community. It's where my brother, Joaquin, and I were raised by my mom, where we went to school. We were baptized just over there at the Guadalupe Church. We got a great public school education just a few, few blocks away, and I had the honor of serving these neighborhoods as mayor of San Antonio for five years. <laughs> you know, this morning, I rode the number 68 bus with my brother down Guadalupe Street, like we did so many times when we were kids. Only this time, I brought my daughter Karina with me. That was the same route that we used to take with my mother to get to school or to go to her work during the summer. I want you all to look around this neighborhood. There are no front runners that are born here, but I've always believed that with big dreams and hard work, anything is possible in this country. This community is a community like so many others across the nation, a community of good people, of humble people, people who go to work early and stay late, oftentimes at more than one job so they can provide for their family. When they go to bed at night, they say hopeful prayers. They want their children to do well. They want good health. 
They want the dignity that comes from a good job and the peace of mind that comes from being able to retire on their own terms. This is a community built by immigrants. <laughs> families from Mexico, but also families from Germany and from other countries. It's a community also built by Native Americans. Yeah. Families who worked to build a future. Folks who came here to serve our country at Fort Sam Houston and Lackland and Randolph Air Force Base. And today, this community represents America's future. Diverse, fast growing, optimistic, a place where people of different backgrounds have come together to create something truly special. And I'm proud to call myself a son of San Antonio. You know, six years ago, I had the honor of standing before the Democratic National Convention. I said then that the American dream is not a sprint or even a marathon, but a relay. My story wouldn't be possible without the strong women who came before me and passed me the baton. Because of their hard work, I have the opportunity to stand in front of you today. My family's story wouldn't be possible without a country that challenged itself to live up to the promise of America. That was the point of the American dream. It wasn't supposed to be just a dream. America was a place where dreams could become real. But the thing is that right now, the relay isn't working. Today, we're falling backwards instead of moving forward. And the opportunities that made America the America that we love, those opportunities are reaching fewer and fewer people. Today, we're at risk of dropping that baton. And that's why we're all here this morning, because we're going to make sure that the promise of America is available to everyone in this 21st century. You see, I learned from my mother so many years ago in this community that when we want change, we don't wait for change, we work for it. When my grandmother got here almost 100 years ago, I'm sure that she never could have imagined that just two generations later, one of her grandsons would be serving as a member of the United States Congress, and the other would be standing with you here today to say these words, I am a candidate for President of the United States of America. Thank you. Cuando mi abuela llegó aquí hace ya casi 100 años, estoy seguro que nunca se imaginó que solo dos generaciones después, uno de sus nietos formaría parte del Congreso de los Estados Unidos y que el otro estaría ante ustedes hoy diciendo las siguientes palabras. Yo soy candidato para presidente de los Estados Unidos. I'm running for president because it's time for new leadership, because it's time for new energy, and it's time for a new commitment to make sure that the opportunities that I've had are available to every American. In the years to come, we must go forward as one nation, working toward one destiny, and that destiny is to be the smartest, the healthiest, the fairest, and the most prosperous nation on earth. Again, 
In this 21st century, we must be the smartest, the fairest, the healthiest, and the most prosperous nation on Earth. Demanding anything less is a failure of vision, and achieving anything less is a failure of leadership. To be the smartest nation requires an early investment in our children's education. As mayor, I challenged the voters to raise the sales tax to span high-quality full-day pre-K for thousands of San Antonio four-year-olds. At the time, some said that it was unrealistic, even impossible. The education wasn't my job, they said. And by the way, who's going to vote for a sales tax increase in the state of Texas? <laughs> but the future of this community was my job. So I put my faith in the people. Yeah. We called our initiative Pre-K for SA. And we brought together business leaders with educators, with parents and students to make the case. And in November of 2012, the voters of this city said, yes, we believe in investing in early childhood education. So that next fall, I found myself standing outside a Pre-K for SA Early Childhood Center as the first group of young students arrived for their very first day of school. They had their little backpacks on. A lot of them were excited. Some of them were crying. <laughs> Truth be told, more of the parents were crying than the students. Sure, there were some tears of sadness of seeing their little ones walking into school for the first time. But there were also tears of joy. The joy of knowing that a great pre-kindergarten education was the first step on the road to a brighter future. Today, we live in a world in which brain power is the new currency of success. If we want to compete, and we better, we need everybody's talent. We don't have a single person to waste. Everybody counts in this country. Here in San Antonio, I made pre-K for SA happen. As president, I'll make pre-K for the USA happen. Universal pre-kindergarten for all children whose parents want it so that all of our nation's students can get a strong start. And you know what? We're not going to stop there. We'll work to make the first two years of college, a certification program, or an apprenticeship accessible and affordable so millions more young people and people who are returning to school later in life can get the skills that they need to get a good job without incurring a mountain of debt. Now, to be the healthiest nation, we need a better health care system in this country. Not a health care system that bends to the will of big pharma or the big insurers, but a health care system that's built for the people who actually need health care. For as long as I knew her, my grandmother was diabetic, like many folks in this community. And she grew older, and her condition got worse. She needed more and more treatment. Thank God Medicare was there for her. Woo! Medicare should be there for everybody in this country. It's time for Medicare for all, universal health care for every single American. To be the fairest nation, we have to reform and reimagine our justice system. All over this nation, for far too many people of color, any interaction with the police can become fatal. If police in Charleston can arrest Dylan Roof after he murdered nine people worshiping at Bible study without hurting him, then don't tell me that Michael Brown and Tamir Rice and Ayanna Jones and Eric Garner and Jason Carroll and Stephon Clark and Sandra Bland shouldn't still be alive today.
We're going to keep saying their names and those of too many others just like them who were victims of state violence. We're going to keep saying that black lives matter while working toward a justice system where that's true. And you know what else is true? For far too many people, they can't afford bail. And an accusation alone can swiftly turn into a jail sentence. In our country, innocent until proven guilty shouldn't just be reserved for the wealthy few who can afford high-priced defense lawyers. Innocent until proven guilty should apply to every single American in this country. We must also reform our immigration system so that keeping families together instead of tearing them apart is our policy. Just a couple of days ago, President Trump visited McAllen, Texas, just south of here. After he'd claimed that we're facing an invasion at the border, the president called it a national security crisis. Well, there is a crisis today. It's a crisis of leadership. Donald Trump has failed to uphold the values of our great nation. Yes, there are serious issues that need to be addressed in our broken immigration system. But seeking asylum is a legal right. And the cruel policies of this administration are doing real harm and damage. One of the things that I remember most about my grandmother is how she would talk to Joaquin and me about how she came to this country as a child separated from her dying mother. Even as a 70-year-old woman, when she remembered those moments, she would cry like the seven-year-old girl she was when it happened because she never had a chance to say goodbye to her mom. Yeah, we have to have border security, but there's a smart and a humane way to do it. And there is no way in hell that caging babies is a smart or a good or a right way to do it. We say no to building a wall and yes to building community. We say no to scapegoating immigrants and yes to dreamers. Yes to keeping families together. Yes to finally passing comprehensive immigration reform in this country. If we all work together, we can build a nation more prosperous, not only for those who are already doing well, but for everybody else. We can raise the minimum wage so that people don't have to work two or three jobs just to put food on the table. We can protect a woman's right to make her own decisions about her body because for women, access to reproductive health care is an economic issue. We can protect the right of workers to organize in an economy that is quickly changing and leaving too many workers behind. And we can protect people from discrimination no matter who they love or how they identify. And we'll work to make sure every American has a safe, decent, and affordable place to live in this country. You know, as Housing Secretary, I visited 100 different communities, big and small, all across our nation, from downtown Los Angeles to rural Wisconsin to San Juan, Puerto Rico, and the Pine Ridge Reservation. And this much is clear. We have a housing affordability crisis in this country. Today, too many families are spending more than half of their income on rent. And that means that more families are doubling up, sleeping on the couches of relatives, or even sleeping on the streets. But you know what? You hardly ever hear about that in politics. That's going to change. We will invest in housing that's affordable to the middle class and to the poor. And I know that we can turn things around. 
In the Obama administration, we made ending homelessness a priority, starting with veteran homelessness. And by the time we were done, we'd cut veteran homelessness almost in half. In the years to come, we can do that and more. Now, the biggest threat to our prosperity in this 21st century is climate change. Don't let anybody tell you that we have to choose between growing our economy and protecting our planet. We can fight climate change and create great jobs in America. And here's the thing, we don't have a moment to waste. Scientists tell us that if we don't get serious about this right now, the consequences will be tragic. So we won't wait. As president, my first executive order will recommit the United States to the Paris Climate Accord. We're gonna say no to subsidizing big oil and say yes to passing a Green New Deal. So those are just some of the ways that we're going to become the smartest, the healthiest, the fairest, and the most prosperous nation on Earth. It is a blueprint for 21st century opportunity. And so you know, so you know that this is always about you. I won't be accepting a dime of PAC money in this campaign. And as president, will work to overturn Citizens United to get big money out of politics. So that's why I'm running, and that's what I'm running for. Now I'm gonna have a lot more to say in the coming days and weeks about my plans. But throughout our nation's history, even in its darkest days, there have always been patriots who came together to do the hard work that it took to get us closer to our nation's ideals. Those who fought to abolish slavery, suffragists who marched and organized for a woman's right to vote. A generation that sat in at lunch counters and marched across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. The activists at Stonewall. Those who inspired a generation that is marching for our lives today people who challenged us to continue to perfect our union. You and I, we stand on their shoulders, generations of men and women who made beds and made sacrifices, who fought in wars and fought discrimination, who picked crops and also stood in picket lines. They didn't wait. They made our nation what it is today. And now it's our turn to take that baton and to make our nation better than it's ever been before. To my fellow Americans, from Texas to Washington State, to New England, to Florida, to California and Illinois, to Iowa. And to our fellow Americans in Puerto Rico. I'm asking you to join me. You give me your support. And I give you my word, I will spend every day working hard to make sure that you can get a good job, that you can find a decent place to live, that you can have good health care when you get sick, and that your children and grandchildren can reach their dreams, no matter who you are or where you come from. We have always been at our best when we're united by something bigger. And in this journey, in the days to come, together we will show that hope can be bigger than fear, that light can be bigger than darkness, and that truth can be bigger than lies. Yeah.
And as long as we work for it, tomorrow will always be better than today. So let's go work. Vamonos. And he makes it official, former HUD Secretary Julian Castro and the former mayor of San Antonio has in fact declared he is running for president in 2020 with Selena playing in the background there. I in fact want to bring in now uh, joining us from the ground there, Dallas Morning News political reporter Gromer Jeffers. He was there at the site and heard the speech as well and he joins me now. So Gromer, from this speech, what do you think will really resonate with the base that Castro is trying to reach? Well, the, the, the contrast about doing it all together, truth being bigger than lies, that's a direct slap at, at President Donald Trump. And there's a feeling in the, you know, with, with Democrats, independents, with a lot of voters out there, that they want to, to get back to something that's more presidential. I talked to a lot of folks here. They say they just want someone, quote, decent, in the White House and that Julian Castro, the former San Antonio mayor, is a good guy. And, and the other thing is his story. It's, it's an immigrant story. He talked a lot about his grandmother and that how she would never envision, uh, you know, one grandson being in Congress and the other being a president, a presidential candidate saying, I'm running for president. So it's his story, his background, and, you know, just the hope to get back on the path of something positive that I think will resonate with a lot of voters. Castro mentioned some really popular progressive policies, education reform, uh, a Green New Deal, right. Medicare for all. And in an interview uh, earlier this week, he supported Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's marginal tax increase on the wealthy. Why do you think it is he's embracing these stances? Because I think he sees room in a Democratic primary, he sees room to get to, to, to the progressive Democratic wing of things. You know, the, the Bernie Sanders wing, if I will. He sees that there's area there, there's room there that he can grow and, and, and make his mark as a candidate. You know, you got folks like Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren and maybe Joe Biden. You know, they will be more like traditional Democrats. I think he sees a... a, a a path for him there, the new Democrat, if I will. The new Democrat. We know that Castro is Mexican American. In fact, I can hear the Selena Bitty Bitty Bomba playing in the background there. That's right. <laughs> uh, you, you, you can't forget her. Well, something that he also embraced in the speech and throughout his political career was that uh, was that actually a factor in his decision to run? Yes, it, it, it was. And, you know, look, right now he's the only. Hispanic candidate in the race. I mean, he's the only candidate that has this kind of flavor. I mean, what you're hearing in the background. So you know, this is him, this is his, his history. And a lot of folks will gravitate toward that. A lot of folks are, are saying it's time. It's time to have a candidate like Castro, an Hispanic, the first Hispanic president. What do you make of the timing of this announcement? Well, he needs to get out early because there are potential big names waiting in the wings to jump into this race. He needs time to build his name recognition, to get to Iowa and New Hampshire, the early primary states, and, 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 and build his candidacy there. And also, uh, you know, he has to get out and see what his viability is because there's another Texan that could be in the race. And I think that's looming large. Beto O'Rourke, if, if this, the former congressman and Senate candidate gets in, I think Julian Castro will have to reevaluate things. So he's going to use this time early in a race to really, really to see what his strengths are, if there's a real path, and, and, and go from there. Castro's positioning himself as an outsider. 
But we know that he's worked in the Obama administration and was considered a potential running mate for Hillary Clinton at one point. How does he reconcile those two facts? And could that be an issue for him moving forward? Yeah, I don't know that he can reconcile those two facts. I mean, he's former uh, HUD sec housing secretary, uh, a contender to be vice president, uh, Hillary Clinton's running mate. I don't think he, he can separate that. I do think he can position himself as something different, maybe not a traditional Democrat, as we talked before, a new Democrat, but a Democrat who has served in the institutions, who has served under Obama. You know, but he, no, he, he's not an outsider. He's just something different. All right, Gromer, I want to thank you very much for joining us. And, I, and next time I have you on, Gromer, I'm going to ask you what your favorite Selena song is. I have a feeling we're going to be hearing a lot of Selena at his political rallies. Right. <laughs> I, I think we will. <laughs> you know, it would be interesting. Selena in Iowa at an Iowa rally. That might be kind of cool. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that as well. Uh, Gromer Jeffers, thank you so much for joining us, Gromer. Appreciate your time. Anytime.